Hello, and welcome back to Cultural Geography. So as I mentioned before, I'll be making video lectures to accompany this chapter in your textbook. The video is only going to highlight some of the key points in the chapter, but not all of them. Therefore, it's your responsibility for the material covered in the textbook, as you will be quizzed on this material as well. In this video lecture, I introduce push-pull factors that are associated with migration and some case examples of migration. So on that note, let's get moving. So people migrate for a number of reasons, such as environmental, economic, cultural, and socio-political. The reasons people migrate can be divided into two things, push and pull factors. So push factors induces people to move out of their present location. Push factors are generally a result of some type of negative consideration, so a negative home condition such as lack of prospects for career advancement, poverty and low incomes, high unemployment rates, persecution and poor human rights, internal conflict and war, natural disasters, climate change, and famine are just some examples of push factors. Pull factors, on the other hand, induce people to move into a new location. Whereas push factors drive migrants out of their original location, pull factors are responsible for dictating where these travelers end up. So pull factors are generally a result of a positive condition in the new location, such as prospects for better job, lower crime rates and peace, prospects of better education for them or their children, availability of food and water, greater political freedom, greater gender equality are some of the pull factors. So let's take an example that incorporates both pull and push factors. So the first is the Great Depression, or the Great Migration is a case example here. The Great Migration is a term used to describe the movement of African Americans from the South to urban cities of the North. So the Great Migration, or the relocation of more than 6 million African Americans from the rural South to the cities of the North, the Midwest, and the West from 1910 to 1970, had a huge impact on urban life in the United States. Driven from their homes by unsatisfactory economic opportunity and harsh segregation laws, many blacks headed north, where they could take advantage of the need of industrial workers at first arose during the First World War, as Chicago, New York, and other cities saw their black populations expand exponentially. Migrants were forced to deal with poor working conditions and competition for living space, as well as widespread racism, racism and prejudice. So during the Great Migration, African Americans began to build a new place for themselves in public life, actively confronting economic, political, and social challenges, and creating a new black urban culture that would exert enormous influence in the decades to come. So some historians differentiate between the Great Migration periods as the first migration between 1910 to 1940 were about 1.6 million African Americans left the South to relocate to the North. And the second migration happened between about 1940 and 1970, and 5 million relocated. So the significance of the Great Migration is that it results in the largest population shift in this country in which almost one-tenth of the American population shifted from the South to the north. So that's a pretty big, pretty big move, and we're not seeing anything like that now. So why it occurred? The Great Migration occurred for many reasons, and it was triggered by push factors to leave the south and incentives from the north as pull factors. Up until this point, so let's look at some of these uh, these these push factors first. So demise of the cotton, so plummet in the world cotton prices in 1913, a widespread boll weevil infestation which swept across the south, devastated uh, cotton fields, and a series of floods ravaged the Mississippi Valley region from 1915 to 1927. So up until this point, the south economy was largely dependent on this cotton, and these three disastrous events 
occurred beginning in 1930, which was the devastation of the, the crops. So push factors. So some other push factors were racial climates. Slavery was abolished in 1865, but equal treatment of the blacks continued. There was the KKK, there was the Jim Crow laws, which mandated segregation in all public facilities. Public schools, public places, buses, restrooms, and restaurants. Losing the right to vote through having to own land or have uh, poll taxes or literacy tests, all kind of disincentivized or made impossible for African Americans to vote. Some poll factors included industrialization, so the expansion of the railroad, the Industrial Revolution, and the increase in production related to World War I caused huge labor, uh, labor migrant shortages in the North during the 20th century. So where foreign migrants uh, migration slowed to a triple because of the war, factory jobs of the North that had previously been filled easily and cheaply through immigrants remained open. So pull factors, opportunities related to education and women, uh, Jim Crow laws resulted in inferior schools in African American children as I just mentioned earlier, the Jim Crow laws were state and local laws that enforce racial segregation in the south of the United States, enacted after the Reconstruction period. These laws continue to enforce until 1965. They mandated racial segregation in all public facilities in the state of the former Confederate State of America, starting in 1890, with a separate but equal status for African Americans. And so basically what we ended up with was a body of laws that institutionalized a number of economic, educational, and social disadvantages for African Americans. However, the North had a more equitable education system, and the African American women of the North were beginning to have more employment prospects, working in machine shops as elevator operators, clerical work, and streetcar conductors. All these were pull factors to leave the South, and were pulling them to the North. So where were the migrants to go? Here's a map showing um, the major uh, migratory routes, and these are a result of, of um, the rail transportation. You know, we can see most of the people are going to the north. A few are going to out west to Oakland and Los Angeles. But kind of notice that people are leaving to kind of major cities. They're not going to these small areas, these small urban areas, rural areas. Uh, they're going to larger urban areas where the job opportunities are better. So as we discussed before, when people migrate, they bring with them their culture, and music was certainly a big part of this culture. So along with, uh, with them leaving for better opportunities, they brought with them their, their blues styles, and you can see kind of where we have East Texas and the Mississippi Delta and the Piedmont. So that's how we've been influenced as well with, through music in migration. So here's another example of uh, migratory reasons, and these are environmental factors, and we'll look at the, kind of some push factors here. And poor agricultural practices and years of sustained drought caused the Dust Bowl, where plains grasses had been deeply plowed and planted with wheat. So during the years when there was adequate rainfall, the land produced bountiful crops. But as the droughts of the early 1930s deepened, the farmers kept plowing and planting and nothing would grow. The ground cover that held the soil in place was now gone. So when drought struck from 1934 to 1937, the soil lacked the strong root system of grass as an anchor, so that the winds easily picked up the loose topsoil and swirled it into the dense dust clouds called black blizzards. So the Dust Bowl forced tens of thousands of families to abandon their farms Many of these families, who were often known as Okies because they came from Oklahoma, migrated to California and other states to find that the Great Depression had basically rendered the economy of those states just as bad, if not worse. So here's an example of these push factors, some kind of farming practices and drought that drove these people out. So another major disaster, Hurricane Katrina, represents an environmental push factor that forced migrants out. 
So what is the key behind this map? What we're looking at here is these little circles represent the number size of the applications from the zip code. So basically where these people uh, moved to. So as we can see from this map, and what we talked about before in Ravenstein's Law, when people migrate, they tend to migrate only short distances. And so here we can see New Orleans, where the Hurricane Katrina hit and devastated a lot of, of Louisiana. People didn't move very far. In all those circles, we can see the clusters. And what do we know, notice about these clusters? Generally speaking, where people move to, they move to bigger, larger cities. They didn't move to small, little rural areas. And they also didn't move very far away. You can kind of see that people moved kind of north and northeast predominantly, and then kind of going out to California and Los Angeles and San Diego and San Francisco, Seattle and Portland. But very few people moved to Idaho. If they did, it looked like it was Boise. So the idea is that people didn't move very far away, and when they do move, it's generally speaking, it's going to a larger urban city. Here's another environmental factor, but uh, perhaps more of a positive one. And this is looking at populations for Florida. And people are retiring and moving to Florida. And the reason they're moving to Florida is for the good weather. Uh, sunny days, warm, better on the bones and joints, I guess. So people are going to Florida for the weather. But that is also an environmental factor. Um, those are pull factors. So this map illustrates the number of Syrian asylum applicants in the European Union. And notice that Germany has the largest number of applicants by the size of that circle there in the middle of the map. We'll talk more about Germany and refugees in the next slide. But due to civil war, these people are being forced to migrate from their home country. So basically they're being pushed out of their home country and then they're being pulled into these newer countries. These are not newer countries, these new countries for them. Um, and Germany happens to be the number one destination. So why is Germany allowing so many migrants to enter? For Germany's economy, the influx of up to 1.1 million refugees in 2015 could be exactly what Europeans or Europe's large economy needs to rejuvenate its grain workforce. Or it could become a burden on the nation's generous welfare system. Let's look at these two population pyramids for Germany. So in 2016 and 2035 on the right. What can we gather from this? Well, the number of people in the workforce is decreasing. The number of dependents over 65 are increasing dramatically, and few children are being born. So this has a potential to cause economic problems for Germany in the not too distant future. So Germany's Chancellor, Angela Merkel, is banking on the idea that refugees could fill the workforce gap. There's just one problem. And most of the, the of, of these refugees lack the skills German companies need. So many of the companies contend that a lack of German language skills, the inability of most refugees to prove any qualifications, and uncertainty about their permission to stay in the country means there's little they can do in the short term. So most large German companies, especially those in manufacturing, prefer to hire through structured apprenticeship programs in which they train young people for up to four years for these highly skilled and sometimes company-specific jobs. But the recent arrivals of Syrian, Iraqi, Afghanistan, and elsewhere are mainly ill-prepared for such training, they say. Less than 15% of the refugees from Syria and other war-torn countries have completed vocational training or any university degree, according to a September 2015 study by the Germans Institute for Employment Research. Even those with training often don't have the skills expected in Germany. On average, 8th grade in pre-war Syria had a similar level as 3rd grade students in Germany. So, while most of the refugees are unlikely to leave any time soon, Germany may have no force but to invest in training these people. So that's kind of the key reason why they're hoping to have all these refugees come in is to their workforce. Somebody has to get in this workforce not only to keep the economy going, but also pay all the taxes that are required for these um, social programs. So 
So here we're turning our attention to the United States. Refugees who have arrived from Syria since 2012 have been placed in 231 towns and cities. Some of them have reached larger cities like Chicago and Houston, but most have been sent to more affordable, medium-sized cities. For example, Boise, Idaho has accepted more refugees than New York and Los Angeles combined. The United States has now accepted nearly 12,000 Syrian refugees since the Civil War began five years ago. America has traditionally been a melting pot, which is a metaphor for this heterogeneous society becoming more homogeneous. The different elements basically melting together into a harmonious whole with a common culture. The essence, I should say, the essence of the melting pot is that immigrants assimilate to the new culture. However, today the trend is towards multiculturalism, not assimilation. The old melting pot metaphor is given way to new metaphors such as salad bowl and mosaic. So mixtures of various ingredients that keep their individual characteristics. So immigrant populations with the United States are not being blended together in one pot, but rather they are transforming American society into a truly multicultural mosaic. Rather than assimilating, multiculturalism is the coexistence of diverse cultures where culture includes race, religion, or cultural groups and is manifested in this customary behavior, cultural assumptions and values, patterns of thinking, and community kind of styles. So it should be pointed out that multicultural is not just limited to these refugees, but any kind, any immigrant coming to the United States uh, could have these different cultural beliefs and decide that um, they prefer to have this multiculturalism and not assimilate into uh, the American culture. And that's the uh, big question of what's going to happen in the future. On that note, have a great day.